If you want to understand cool in the 90s, look no farther than the kid from Kid Chameleon. He's got sunglasses, a black leather jacket, a white t-shirt, and two, I guess. And that sums it up, really. That's all it took to be cool, it seems. Kids are going missing at the local arcade as they're all getting trapped by an AI named Heady Metal that lives within a virtual reality video game. It's up to the kid to become the one player that's too tough to beat and to save those who were defeated by the game from the clutches of this rogue AI. And becoming such a true enough player is a tall order. The game boasts over 100 levels and over 1,850 screens. Whatever that means. This is mentioned on both the front and back of the game's cover, and is a fact reiterated by just about every single gaming magazine that reviewed the game back in the day. This game is big, and to this day is known for being brutally difficult. Gamers, you ever play a game that was insane, brutal, uh, shut up, I'm not done yet, unforgiving, frustrating. Discussions around this game always end up revolving around how unforgiving it is. So I think it'll be interesting to take a look at what review articles from video game publications in the 90s said about Kid Chameleon's difficulty. Issue 4 of Mega Magazine said, The sheer size of the game, however, will put most people off, and the pace of the game, due to the fact that it is such a large game, could definitely do with being turned up a few notches. Huh. In issue 4 of Megatech magazine, there were two reviewers, one saying, It was only when I'd gone halfway through the game on my first go that I found out how dull the game really is. And the second reviewer said, Kid Chameleon is an okayish sort of game, but what I didn't really like about it was that it was just a bit too easy and dull. Not exactly sounding like the brutal game of legends so far. Let's check out a few more. Issue 30 of Sega Power. The only real problem is that it's all over far too quickly. It's another cart that suffers from being far too easy to finish. Insane. Issue 6 of Sega Pro. Kid Chameleon suffers from one main fault. It is, of course, far too easy. Brutal. Issue 18 of Mean Machines has another two reviewers' perspectives. Kid Chameleon is very playable, but it suffers from being a little easy. Unforgiving. And the other, the game is far too easy to finish. It's an enjoyable game that should appeal more to platform game beginners. Bit of a disconnect happening here. Taking a step back from the difficulty for a moment, I want to make note of the game's legacy. There has never been any sequels or remakes of Kid Chameleon, but that doesn't stop some people from still mentioning it somewhere in their lists of favorite Genesis games. Sega themselves also seem keen on remembering this title, at least tentatively, as it's continually brought back whenever they need to pay rent for that month and release another Genesis game collection. So it must be a classic that's worth going back to, right? Well, looking back again to video game magazine reviews of the time, Kid Chameleon got quite a range of scores. It got scores as high as 93% and as low as 49%, with plenty of 8 out of 10s, 7 out of 10s, and 6 out of 10s in the mix. I'm not going to pretend opinions and reviews should be consistent or objective, but usually when there's a discrepancy like this, we're talking about something that isn't for everyone. Perhaps something where some people may get it and some don't. Something that begs for a deeper look. But this isn't Deadly Premonition or Scorn we're talking about. This is a mascot platformer from 1992. How complicated can it be? So. We have a Sega Genesis all-time classic that's supposed to be fantastic, or it may possibly be middling to bad, and it's known for being notoriously difficult, Frustrating. but may actually be so easy that it's boring. With us suitably set up as far as introductions go, why don't we try to find the truth for ourselves? On the surface, the game seems strikingly similar to the Super Mario Bros. games that came out years before Kid Chameleon. Jump on enemies' heads, hit blocks and collect loot from them, power-ups with unique abilities, ending a stage by getting to the flagpole. Though this is where comparisons stop and Kid Chameleon shows how it differs, in both drastic and subtle ways. You see, with platformers like this, there's a couple types of structures you can expect. Usually you'll be going from level 1 to level 2 to... What was I again? 
Oh, oh yeah, level three and so on. Or there may be a world map where you can have some choice in what level you want to tackle. Kid Chameleon went out of its way to be different and made up its own structure that I've yet to see replicated in any other platformer. Here's a map that illustrates the different paths players may take through their adventure. You start at the top here, and then you just sort of... And then you reach the end. Do you get it? You don't? Let's bring up a map that helps illustrate it better. Put simply, the game is divided into four stages, with each encompassing a chunk of the game's 103 levels. Every stage ends with a boss, and each subsequent stage gets more convoluted with its pathing. As I'm sure you noticed, many levels connect to more than just one other one. Flagpoles aren't the only way to finish a level. As a matter of fact, some don't even have a flagpole, period. Liberally placed in the levels are teleporters. Some take you back to the very start of the level you were just playing, some take you to bonus levels, some take you to horrible levels that are only meant to waste your time and lives, and some just take you to a normal other level. Before going through the teleporter, there is absolutely no way of knowing what you're stepping into. Let us analyze one of these situations these teleporters put us through. Here we have a dead end with two teleporters, which gives us a 50-50 chance of choosing a path that takes us closer to reaching the last boss, or we can find ourselves in one of the most notorious levels in the game that will waste away our remaining lives and continues. And if you do manage to beat it, it's just going to spit you back out at the previous level with the two teleporters again. So, choose wisely. In this scenario happens more than once. With this sense of uncertainty looming over the player, exploring is simultaneously punished and rewarded. If you stay the course and don't visit too many weird teleporters, you'll be less likely to land in one of the more difficult levels. However, if you play too safe and just make a break for the end of the level, you'll be missing out on possible lives and extra continues. But there are also other times when you'll only get death for exploring. Wow. That looks really suspicious. There's no way that's just a dead end. Uh, no, no, this is this is just a dead end. Ouch. And now I'm dead. The game can feel very stream of consciousness and disorientating, in part thanks to these teleporters and the odd structure the game has, but also because the four stages of the game share largely the same level themes between them. You don't get a sense of natural progression as a result, since the whole game you'll be going through the exact same woodlands, caves, mountains, beaches, etc. This also doesn't help the game from feeling samey and repetitive after a few hours of play, a view shared by many a reviewers. The level design itself is simple near the start of the game, but it doesn't take too long for them to start getting maze-like. Some parts of levels may even loop back into itself, sometimes offering more than one path to approach a level. Other times, a player may wander into one of these loops and feel like they just wasted their time. And then there are also just dead ends. This adds to the stream of consciousness nature of the game, as oftentimes you just gotta pick a direction and hope for the best. Aside from the game's peculiar structure, another standout feature of Kid Chameleon are the power-ups, as one might hope, as they are literally the name of the game. These different helmet transformations give abilities that will be obvious to players, like running into blocks with the Skull Rhino, wall jumping with the Fly, and shooting skulls with the Tank. But there are more obscure attributes to some of the abilities too, which new players may not immediately notice like being able to jump higher with the samurai. Or if you tap a jump as the kid when he's against a ledge, he's able to vault over the edge of blocks. Or the gem power-ups. You see, when you collect 100 gems, nothing. Nothing happens. You can't even collect 100, it stops at 99. Are you stupid? Instead, you expend the gems with a clunky A plus start input. And depending on what transformation you are and how many gems you have, a different effect happens. I rarely bother using them as I find it too difficult to remember what mask has what power and at what cost as that information is only in the manual. I only would remember the most helpful powers, like the knight having the ability to give you a health upgrade for 50 gems. You can continue to stack these upgrades, and they're shared between the other helmet abilities, but the upgrades are lost once you lose a life. The knight ability isn't terribly common to begin with, but it gets incredibly rare in the second half of the game. Over the course of stage 3 and 4's 56 levels, it's only found in 5, making it unlikely you'll be able to take advantage of this very useful ability for most of the game. 
It makes me wish there was a storefront you could occasionally visit to exchange upgrades and lives for gems, a la something like Fantasy Zone or Wonder Boy, who were able to accomplish the concept years prior back in both arcades and Master System. I digress. You'll want to take advantage of the night as much as you can in the early game, as once you run out of continues and get a game over, you are kicked back to the title screen. That's it. You're done. No saves, no passwords. They went out of their way to avoid having a saving system due to the added costs that would bring. But I haven't seen mention for why there's a lack of even a password system. Echo the Dolphin, another Genesis title with a notorious legacy for being brutally difficult, check out this video that I did about it, it's really cool, had a password system that could take you to any level. Without even that, beginner players will find themselves going through the same stage 1 levels many times over. A criticism that can be found in game review magazines, and certainly not something that helps some players feeling like the game gets too dull and monotonous. People have a hard time agreeing on the music and graphics of Kid Chameleon. Even for people who liked the gameplay side of things, it can sometimes feel like a coin toss whether they'll like the music and graphics or not. Kid Chameleon's sound and music has a distinctive metallic quality to it, made famous, or infamous, by the program Gems, which was popularly used by Western game devs when programming for the Genesis. I oft forget every stage theme has its own unique music track. Many of them end up just blending together for me. Some of the songs are pleasant enough, though others can feel like their melodies are too short and you hear them loop too often. Sometimes you just want something longer than 30 seconds. A few of these quick to loop tracks seek to be ambitious enough to cram in a climax into those 30 seconds, which can start feeling like the songs are wanting to devolve into borderline noise after having them on loop a few times. And then there's whatever the backing channel to the track Chase Scene is trying to do. Graphics are... they're there. Trees are trees, caves are caves, mountains are mountains. There's nothing in the execution of the game's art to have things come together for a distinct vision that could be recognizable. That all isn't to say the game's art is bad, just simply uninspired. In the early stages of development, the people behind Kid Chameleon were hoping to make The Kid Sega's next mascot after Alex Kid, until Sonic swooped in and immediately crushed their dreams. Say what you want about Sonic, but he undeniably has a distinctive charm and style. You know when you're looking at the Sonic Zone. His world, thanks in part to the music, comes together to be distinctly Sonic. These grass blocks and city streets in Kid Chameleon could come from any mid-tier game from the era, and you wouldn't bat an eye. A common criticism found only in modern reviews of Kid Chameleon are that of the controls. This includes some reviews who even liked the game. Summed up, running around and jumping feels very slippery, and trying to land on what you want can feel more difficult than it ought to be. This isn't helped by the game often asking you to land on very small platforms that are one or two tiles wide. Nor is it helped by the fact that the game loves using blocks that gives you extra slippery ice physics, regardless of the level's theme. I found myself in a near constant battle with the D-pad, trying to stay in control sometimes resulting in me overcorrecting and falling. Even after playing through the game a few times now, I still haven't felt them click. Reviews that dare to criticize the graphics, music, or controls get defensive commenters saying how they're wrong, the game graphics are actually awe-inspiring, Mario actually controls worse, objectively, and people just need to get good and accept that this was cutting edge in 1992. Some of the levels were so inventive and the bosses looked incredible. Nothing looked or played like this game at the time. Uh, time. What? What? What are you talking about? What do you mean? Look me in the eye and tell me there was nothing that played like this in 1992. I again bring up game review magazines from the time of the game's initial release, where even some of them give the same criticisms of graphics and music that people nowadays do. This opinion isn't wholly from spoiled new age gamers looking at an old game with higher expectations than they should. Some people absolutely love the music and graphics of Kid Chameleon, but speaking for myself and many others, the graphics and sound are... they're fine, they're fine. 
The controls though are less fine. And I think one reason why players who go back to try to play it now find issue with the controls is... I'm about to say something really bold, and I need you to be sitting down for this. Being a gamer or a game developer in current year is far better and more appealing than it was back in the early 90s. There are some major issues with gaming today. I'm not refuting that. We're all, we're all gonna die. <laughs> but it's also far easier to develop games and far cheaper to buy them. And nowadays, we at least have a firm understanding of how a character moving around and jumping along a 2D plane should feel like. Back in the 80s and 90s, that understanding of game feel was harder to come across. Now that we've gone over the major strokes of more stilted game reviews, I can throw out this list and now I can articulate some specifics of Kid Chameleon's level design philosophies. The game has a lot of beginner's traps, so buckle in because I got another list here. There are iron blocks that have drills inside of them, which only shoot out when you're two or three tiles away from them. These are identical to the non-trap blocks which they imitate. It's occasionally obvious to deduce when these blocks will contain traps, but other times they just take you by surprise and often make you wonder how you were meant to react unless you lived in constant fear of any iron block. One of the most commonly used tiles in the game. The level designers loved using invisible blocks. These occasionally led to optional secret goodies that helped me. Other times, they seemed to have been placed in just enough of a specific spot knowing that they would mess up a jump. Or they might even bait me into a trap. I can't help but think of bad Mario ROM hacks or Mario Maker levels, or even Mario-styled rage bait games from the 2000s that would often use invisible blocks to a similarly frustrating effect, which Kid Chameleon managed to predate by years. I guess it really is cutting edge. It's inevitable that you'll come across a level that demands you use a specific power-up to progress. These are occasionally hidden in secrets, or might even be placed within one of these invisible blocks. Jamming your head into every ceiling, hoping to find the invisible secret necessary to progress, isn't good or fun level design. No, not even when Mario did it at one time in an offshoot optional challenge level that you were meant to do in multiplayer. Yet another type of block is what I like to refer to as chain reaction blocks. You touch them and a spike shoots out from it, in what direction or directions one shoots out being depicted on the block itself. These are used for some light puzzling to break other blocks or initiate other chain reaction blocks, but the game also loves using them as traps. If you ever activate one and see it shoot a spike far off screen, just know that it triggered other chain reaction blocks that are about to shoot back at you any second. This happens a lot. Too much. There are times when you are meant to put your trust into the level designer's hands, like maybe a leap of faith, but this is often a mistake. In the case of drop downs, stopping to check below yourself constantly isn't fun and it grinds the pace of levels to a halt. Nor does it always even work. Even things as innocuous as rocket blocks that are meant to take you to bonuses and power-ups, or elevators that help you progress, can easily lead to you getting crushed. It's often best not to put your trust into the level designer's hands, and to expect only malice and hate from them. There are a couple different types of blocks that will often act as safe platforms or elevators. But occasionally, just to keep you on your toes, they may fall away from your feet into a bottomless pit or rise you up towards the heavens until you get crushed. These undesirable effects happen in the blink of an eye, so you would need to react quick if you'd want to survive. The very last level before the final boss loves hiding these types of traps and otherwise innocuous iron blocks that make up the bulk of the floor of the level. I love that, thank you. Just as it so happens, this is another favorite trap seen in Rage Bait games from the 2000s. These three enemies are the most horribly obnoxious clumps of pixels imaginable. Let's see if you'll notice a theme between them all. Frustrating. The mech is the least offensive of the three, simply moving around left and right and occasionally it shoots at you. There had been many times when one shot at me from off screen and I got hit without being able to react. Whether I knew they were just ahead of me or not, or whether I only just dropped down in front of them or not, it frankly wouldn't matter. I was going to take damage from them one way or another. The cloud floats around and shoots lightning at you from different angles, oftentimes from off screen and before you even knew that they were there. 
The UFO can buzz around at high speeds, making it difficult to hit, and yet it takes multiple hits to fully defeat. It also, you guessed it, can attack you with lasers before you even would know that it was there. Once one gets above you, it just dumps that stuff on you, making you wonder if it'll ever stop. And um, sometimes it just doesn't. Between just these three types of enemies were so many deaths, too numerous of them feeling frustratingly unfair. An honorable mention that I would also love to bring up is this little gremlin, who loves spawning over top of unknowing players' heads, oftentimes damaging them before they even knew that they were there. Only one more stop on my beginner's trap rant list. Adding a minuscule amount of variety to the game, there are three levels known for having a wall of death. An unflinching, continuously moving wall of machinery that if you touch it at all, you die. The first of the three is Hills of the Warrior 1. If you simply hold down the run button and just keep jumping over as much as you can, it's pretty easy to outpace the wall. The only unfair trap here is at the very end, where you're given a choice between going up or down. If you choose down, you're stupid. You can't finish the level now, you gotta forfeit a life to try again, idiot. The second wall of death level is much more difficult. Forced Entry There are two ways to complete the level, along with two paths on offer. The top path has you going through the level as the tank, trying to fit your wide treads through the small gaps and underneath crushing platforms. At the very end, you have to be aware of two appearing and disappearing blocks that aren't there more often than they are, which you have to time perfectly in order to make the jump up to a teleporter. Failing that, you'll be quickly ushered into a dead end. The bottom path has you going through sewers full of enemies, drill blocks, and more crushing platforms. Adding to this, you'll more than likely be running through this gauntlet with only two health. Towards the end, you gotta make the choice between staying back above ground or going down another manhole. Staying up above, dead end, try again. Trying to go down brings you to a small room where the flagpole is towards the left, the opposite direction you've been trained to go for these murder wall levels. And as soon as you'd realize this, you'd probably be dead, either by the ninja down here or the murder wall catching up and covering the flagpole. The third and last wall of death level is Bloody Swamp and it is one of the most notorious in the entire game. You of course need to rush through the level as fast as you can, but the game throws every trick it can to slow you down. Appearing and disappearing blocks that force you to stand and wait, chain reaction blocks that you have to go out of your way to activate at the right times, bouncing blocks that kill your momentum, or other times just have you completely trapped, and crushing platforms that you have to wait for. It's a level that expects a player to learn it and to play it perfectly to clear. So between all three of these levels, we have a common theme of tricks a new player wouldn't have ample time to react to or even foresee. Good old trial and error, my favorite. From all the things that I just listed off, and what I said earlier about untrustworthy teleporters, it gives the sense that the game is actively antagonistic towards the player. With so many deaths feeling so cheap, the weight of there being no saves or passwords is felt even more. But you know what, all of these unfair traps are good because it directly connects back to the story of a villain unfairly defeating players to trap them within the game world. This is a, this is a good life lesson here. If a game has ludonarrative dissonance, it's bad. If it doesn't have ludonarrative dissonance, it's good. Do you remember when that term was all the rage to use in video essays? I started the script four years ago. Life is very different now. Anyway, bring back that stupid floating head. Uh, now's a good time as any to talk about him and how he's the only boss in the entire game. You fight him in four different levels and they're all terrible. <laughs> First boss, three heads skewered on an arrow, moving in a predictable pattern. Just keep spamming the ax to win. Second boss, three floating heads just moving around in a pattern. Just keep spamming the ax to win. Third boss, Three floating heads that just move around in pattern. Last boss, one long head. Just kite him away from the top of the screen and keep bouncing on him. And you win. Not having any interesting way to make them more challenging, the developers gave each head an excessive amount of health. I feel like I shouldn't need to deal 90 damage across the three heads to win here. The third boss is really good at wasting your time as the topmost floating head loves staying too close to the border of the screen to get a good shot at him. And sometimes they're just off screen for extended periods of time. 
making you wait for them to come back for a near minute. No, that's okay. We can just we can continue when you feel like it. Oh, welcome back. Thank you. There's no way that the developers were ignorant of this fault, as you get a time bonus if you beat the level within three and a half minutes. They considered that speedy. I'm sure the developers are also very aware of how samey and underwhelming the bosses are. In a video resume from an artist that worked on Kid Chameleon, Craig Stitt, we have confirmed two unused enemies, a snake and a spider, who according to him were supposed to be bosses or at least mini-bosses. And in an interview with Steve Waida, a programmer on Kid Chameleon, he said that if there was enough time, the one thing he would have wanted to add was more boss levels. This gives the impression that the boss levels were pushed very low on the priority list. And as a result, explains why what we have is... crap. The bosses looked incredible. I mean, there was only one. But oh, have you ever seen anything more divine? Reviews of Kid Chameleon, old and new, always mention the sheer size of the game and how daunting and extreme it is. So without any extra buildup, I'm just gonna say it. The game really isn't that long. At least, certainly not as long as you might assume. If you manage to stay wholly on the main path, you'll go through 52 levels. Nearly half of the heavily advertised number of levels. So don't think that you'll be going through all of them in a single playthrough. And actually, it's impossible to go through all 103 levels in one go. The maximum number you can go through is 93. However, it's severely unlikely that you'll accidentally stumble into such an inefficient and daunting path. You would have to go out of your way to do that. Moreover, 32 of the game's 103 levels aren't even full levels. They're referred to as elsewhere, rather than having a unique name to them. And they range from bonus areas to small challenges. But they're always brief, a fraction of the size of a proper level. That would be like saying every underground bonus area in a Mario game to be a separate independent level. No, that's not, that's not how that works. It takes around three to five hours to beat Kid Chameleon, which isn't super long, but it feels all the more expansive and exhausting with the moment to moment gameplay getting so monotonous, there being a lack of any natural progression, the tiring antagonistic level design, and the fact that the designers intended you to do this in one sitting without saves or passwords. Now that we've made it this far into the video, I think it's time to establish whose side I'm on in this war between this game is made for actual toddlers, and only the best gamers can ever hope to see the end of this. And truthfully, this game has a severe difficulty problem. In the sense, it is ridiculously inconsistent. Most of the game is frankly quite simple and easy. Though every now and again, out of nowhere, the game hits you with a wall that it's going to try to smash your face through. The first time I beat the game, I did so relying on occasional rewinds to retry failures and save states to come back after I was getting burnt out. But after I beat the game, I did the unthinkable. I played it again. <laughs> I wanted to see how far I could go without needing those crutches, and if I could do it in one sitting. This is when I realized that the game's difficulty really isn't that bad. And I was, in fact, able to do it in a single sitting, in just a bit over three hours. A big help was knowing how much the game hated me, and how to avoid those beginner's traps I mentioned. And beside that, some of the game's most difficult levels are easy to bypass completely by simply going along the standard progression path. Which I tended to follow by accident anyways. I had to go out of my way to play the game a third time, just to get footage of the more notorious levels like Bloody Swamp. I will say though, the level Alien Isle is completely miserable and it made me break my rule of no cheats during my second run. At least with the other difficult levels, aside from just skipping them entirely, you can learn what they expect of you, making them a relative breeze afterwards. But then there's Alien Isle. It is a mandatory level, and one that bases itself more on luck than anything. A main bulk of the level has you dropping from a great height, trying to land on a moving platform where you have to hitch a ride on a rocket block where you have to wait 10 seconds for it to ride, where you vault over a wall and then drop from a great height and do it all again, and then again. 
You can't look down to see the moving platform to time your jumps, and there are several UFOs that, if they decide on a whim, are going to rain down a swift death on you. You just need to trudge along and hope you manage to get a lucky run through it. Absolute misery. That rant aside, apart from some sharp spikes like Alien Isle, the difficulty is mostly pretty tame. And if you engage at least somewhat with the levels, you'll be able to find plenty of extra lives and continues. So, why do so many people say this game is brutally, punishingly, impossibly difficult? Well, firstly, most of the people who played this game when it released were children when they played it, and are remembering the game through memories like staying up past their bedtimes, deep into the tenebrous late night hours of 10.24pm, feeling a sense of achievement after beating the boomerang bosses and getting so far as the start of stage 3 after endless retries, half-faded creamsicle flavored summer dreams of showing the game to their friend down the block who then proceeded to be unable to get past level 9 etc, etc. An anecdote from Craig State perfectly summarizes how kids oft aren't the best judges of what's difficult, or how to even play a game. Aside from that, I watched numerous YouTube reviews of Kid Chameleon, and I don't want to single anyone out, but judging by people's footage and comments, most reviewers wouldn't get very far. It felt assured that a bulk of the footage per review was always going to be of stage 1 levels, with some stage 2 maybe sprinkled in. It's doubtful this is for want of avoiding spoilers, as several videos would show footage of them going against the final boss. Which might have you assume that they went through the entire game, but it's worth mentioning that there is a well-known secret in level 2 that warps you directly to the final boss. Which makes this gap in footage all the more noticeable. Apart from making assumptions, one reviewer admitted they played for two hours, got to the second boss, and was feeling burnt out on how repetitive the game was feeling, so he just called it quits there. Another reviewer admitted to getting a game over and calling it quits in a level that was even before the first boss. People seem to feel like they get the gist of what Kid Chameleon has to offer very early on, and it's difficult to blame them too much for that. Though only playing for that long doesn't give a player enough time to settle into the philosophies and pitfalls Kid Chameleon employs. Aside from the traps that I had a whole section about, there are other quirks a player would need to learn when playing Kid Chameleon. Including things like, you see a man made out of fire? Can't jump on him. No, 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 no. You see a ball made out of fire? Can jump on him. Yes, 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 yes. And also, don't get a power-up straight from the block when you're the fly ability, because the game will decide to kill you instantly. Either way, once you play a little bit more, things start clicking together and you can realize that what was once an overwhelming mountain hike is more akin to a stroll through a hill. A hill that happens to have a couple landmines strewn around at random. And there are a couple specific people that we can thank for those landmines. According to artist Craig Stitt, Again, a number of people on the dev team were saying that the game was too difficult, and that the biggest people behind wanting to make the game harder and harder was the game designer Hoyt Ng and the programmer Mark Cerny. Mark also being the guy who established Sega Technical Institute, the long now defunct branch of Sega that developed Kid Chameleon. It was a branch of Sega that was based in California that initially tried to bridge both Western and Japanese game developers together. Kid Chameleon would be the first original IP Sega Technical Institute worked on. And interestingly, most individuals who worked on the game didn't have a single other game credit prior to all KC. In an interview with our now close friend Craig Stitt, in 1990 he applied to a wanted ad Sega put up that mentioned no experience was necessary to join. I feel like this paints the picture of ambitious creators, full of drive and dreams, wanting to prove themselves among some of the most respected game makers of the era. Mark Cerny, who was simultaneously the head of this brand new Sega branch, and the head of Kid Chameleon's development team, surely felt the pressure to make a strong first impression. Hence again, them originally aspiring their character to be Sega's next mascot. Yet with all the ambition, they bit off more than they could chew and didn't quite stick the landing. 
Beyond just the inconsistent difficulty, they fell into the classic trap of choosing quantity over quality. In that previously mentioned interview with our life partner and father to our children, Craig Stitt, he also said that one of the main goals of Kid Chameleon was to make it the longest game on the Genesis. The reasons why they chose quantity feels clear to me though. The game is named after the kids' differing transformation abilities, but just equally important to the marketing of the game is the number that they were able to plaster on the box. Anyone who talks about Kid Chameleon is in essence forced to talk about it, and they needed something to help set them apart from countless similar games on the market. It was largely a marketing ploy, I feel, and one that worked in a monkey's paw type of way. While people can't shut up about how massive the game is, Many others often see that as a con against the game. The devs wanting the game to last and be worth the price of admission wasn't a bad aspiration at least. Using the magazines, we're able to see how much the game costed at the time. And now we can compare that to how much it would cost now and- Oof, no, 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 no thank you. It's now been over three decades since Kid Chameleon released, and time has not been kind to it. It was a one-off that doesn't receive any love or attention from Sega, apart from adding it to every Genesis collection. But why wouldn't they do that when they own the IP outright? That's the bare minimum. They don't even advertise the game or the main character in the packaging of the collection releases. Though, why would they? A random kid in a white t-shirt and jeans isn't exactly recognizable. Over the years, the game continued to be more and more forgotten. Once the game came to the Wii Virtual Console in 2007, modern review sites took a look at the game and gave it a resounding... eh. And I feel like this perfectly encapsulates the point in time in which people beyond a specific niche just wouldn't care for Kid Chameleon. And there you have it, dear viewer. That's the reason for the wildly mixed opinions, both old and new. It's a game that's simultaneously experimental, unique, and expansive yet derivative, dull, and discursive. As a connoisseur of middle-of-the-road platformers that don't add anything new, I can't find any reason to want to replay or recommend Kid Chameleon. Uh, so, uh, don't. And that is the end of Kid Chameleon and its legacy. For now, but perhaps not for long. In current year, Sega is currently prepping an initiative that revitalizes, remakes, and reimagines some of their long-dormant IPs, Kid Chameleon being a possible candidate for such treatment. What's most likely to come from this is a faithful remake that just gives the game a new coat of paint, something akin to the treatment Wonder Boy 3 or Alex Kidd in Miracle World got, I'd wager. This wouldn't be an option I'd see likely to win over people that didn't like the game before, nor could I see that corralling in a strong number of new players. Kid Chameleon had hard enough of a time standing out as a 2D platformer in 1992, and that's only going to be even harder now. Another option they might take though is a sequel that tries to directly riff off of what the original established. Winding, meandering level design with antagonistic traps, big jumps over small platforms, etc. Perhaps they'd take the current legacy of the game's difficulty to heart, pushing it even closer to being a rage game than before. Lastly, a third option. A best case scenario, if you will. They strip away most everything and completely reinvent what Kid Chameleon is. I think one reason Sega never seemed to have considered a sequel or remake until now is largely due to the fact that there's just not enough here. There's no solid core or identity past substandard platformer with a high number of screens. So keep the different abilities, that's literally what the name of the game is from, keep the VR world, since that's semi-trendy nowadays, but completely rework everything else around it. Work on giving the IP a true identity for itself that's beyond generic forest, mountain, lava, and good god maybe dare to put in a second boss. If they announce a new Kid Chameleon and it looked like they were trying to breathe new life into it, I'd honestly put money down to see what they'd come up with. And if they did, I'm sure you and I would reconvene right here again to see how it went. Until then, good night. But before we end the video, we asked and you delivered, so check out this backflip.
Oops. <laughs>